What brought Lane Morris to Afghanistan? Why did he go and what was he doing? Let's ask him right now. I've spoken about you a number of times on the show, but we've never interviewed you before. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Where were you born? How did you come to join the U.S. Army? And what took you to Afghanistan in 2002? Well, like a lot of Americans or uh, even Canadians that joined the military, I, I had a sense of adventure that I wanted to uh, get out, see the world, challenge myself. And so uh, when I graduated from high school, uh, I ended up joining the military and, and got further and further into it and uh, continued to challenge myself till I ended up in uh, a special forces unit. And uh, how old were you when you were deployed to Afghanistan? I actually turned 40 years old in Afghanistan. So I'd been in the military for a long career before uh, I ended up going there. Now, you were there in the early waves with the special forces. What was your particular mission? What, were, what was it like? How many of there were you? Were, you, were, you were an irregular unit in that you weren't, uh, you weren't part of a massive armed adventure. You were uh, an elite unit, am I right? That's right. A special forces team or an A-team is made up of 12 individuals, each with a different specialty or skill. And we work together as a unit and uh, we are, we're tasked with going behind enemy lines or into occupied territory and working with local forces in order to drive out those in power. So the, uh, the mission in Afghanistan was just, was tailor-made for special forces teams and that's why the first there the first year or so, uh, special forces teams exclusively were in Afghanistan driving out the Taliban and hunting down Al-Qaeda. What, uh, may I ask, was your special skill in the A-team? Uh, I'm a demolitions expert, so my job is to uh, blow things up, um, to destroy captured weapons, ammunition, and explosives, and, uh, and then just to participate as part of the team in uh, denying Al-Qaeda and the Taliban free use of whatever territory we were assigned to. And we were assigned to that whole Kaust region to uh, hunt down Al-Qaeda and Taliban forces. Well, tell me about that fateful day in July 2002. You mentioned the town of Kaust, Afghanistan. What was it like and what was your mission on July 27th? Well, we had, had received some intelligence uh, that gave us an indication that uh, there was a, a location that was kind of isolated on the edge of a village outside of Kaust that there was some uh, foreign forces there that we ought to go check out. So uh, that mission started out as an intelligence mission to go and see what was there, who was there, and, uh, and, then, and then decide from there what to do about it. So we got to that location. Uh, we had prior to going to the location that Omar Cotter was at, we had been at another location, our main body. And that main body consisted of half of my team and then about 25 local Afghans that we had been working with and then some 82nd Airborne soldiers that were along with us as, as some additional security. Can I ask? When we had finished with... Uh, sure, I, go I was ahead. gonna say, uh, w did you ever work with Canadian Special Forces back in 2002? Absolutely. When I got to Kaus, the Canadians were already there. We relied on Canadian, the PPCLI, as, as our security. We could not have survived without Canadian forces. A special forces team uh, needs some security, and so our security were those Canadian forces. So they were responsible for the compound that we had uh, set up our camp in. They were responsible for the security of that, of that operating base as well as being our quick reaction force. So Canadians uh, outnumbered us in our base. You'd have 12, uh, 12 Americans and then approximately 50 Canadians. So they were, the, they were the force, they were in charge of the base. They had the base set up for security, Claymore mines, the fighting positions, uh, the 24 hour security. That was their job. We, we could not have functioned without uh, Canadian forces being co-located with us there. Now, here's what's so fascinating, and here's what I think no Canadian knew, is that the base you were at flew both the American and Canadian flags. You sent me some photos that I would like to show right now to Canadians to show what your base looked like. 
and most importantly, that it was Canadians and Americans side by side, maybe even eating together, maybe in the same barracks, bunking in the same room. Is, did you make personal friendships? I, I presume every day you dealt with Canadian sure. PPCLI just as you would uh, fellow Americans. Absolutely. And if, if you drove by the, the base, uh, and when we talk about base, we're really talking about a, a compound that's no bigger than a typical single family home. Uh, when you drove by that, that base, you wouldn't see Americans. Uh, you would see Canadians. You would see Cana Canadians in the fighting positions, manning the uh, checkpoints, uh, checking security. Uh, you, you would see Canadians with their very distinctive helmets and uniforms as opposed to Americans. So other than seeing an American flag flying alongside a Canadian flag, you would really see that, that base as a Canadian facility. So Omar Carter, who was spying on the base, who was surveilling the base, who was laying landmines around the base, as far as he knew, it was, well, in fact, the flag was flying, Canadians outnumbered you two or three to one. He was spying on and landmining Canadians, as well as Americans that day. Absolutely. I've often wondered when I, uh, when I heard that, that uh, Omar engaged in those activities that I wonder if he was conflicted at all to uh, look at Canadians running that base. And, you know, I wonder if he said to himself, wow, those are my, can, those are my countrymen. I, uh, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't be engaged in this type of conflict against them. But I, evidently, it, obviously, it didn't uh, concern him. Well, tell me what happened when you confronted this outpost, this little fortress on the outskirts of the town of Kaust. Tell me what happened when you approached it. Well, I, I approached that, that compound with, with five other soldiers. So there was simply six of us. So th this was not a combat mission. Uh, this was an investigation. Uh, and we, we came upon that compound and uh, simply proceeded to check it out. And as we went anywhere in Afghanistan, people flocked to wherever we were. So the people from the surrounding village who saw us coming surrounded us. So we ended up in a situation where for 45 minutes to an hour, we simply sat outside of that compound and uh, waited for somebody to come out to talk to us. And the village sat there with us. And so, uh, that was that was it. We waited for them. I, we weren't going to go in there uh, because I could look through the through the kind of the crack in a gate and see the uh, the five or six guys in there, and uh, they were obviously getting ready for something. They had their weapons with them, shouldered, and uh, they were discussing the situation and refused to come out and talk to us or even acknowledge our presence. So at that point, I knew we were in a situation that. Uh, was uh, not the best, and we needed to call for some reinforcements.